Hello investigators and welcome to Until the End of Time. My name is Veronica. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is the Scarlet Keys recap video for the middle of August. We have four additional new preview cards to talk about as well as Daryl Simmons, the photographer, the survivor for the Scarlet Keys expansion. The other four cards are the Thief's Kit, which was previewed by Playing Board Games, Quick Getaway, previewed by Mythos Busters, Hello Chalice, previewed by Los Archivos de Arkham, and Grizzled, also previewed by Mythos Busters. Note that I already talked about Thief's Kit and Quick Getaway in the Kamani Jones video. Thank you to everybody who left kind comments on that video, by the way. It's really nice. I put a lot of effort into that video, and I think people really appreciated it, so thank you. Um, and that video was mostly focused on the one character, so that's why I'm talking about them again in this video talking about the broader rogue card pool. And let's start with those. So the Thief's Kit level three is an upgrade to the Thief's Kit level zero that we already saw earlier. This adds three experience, an agility icon. It has the same number of supplies and only an additional plus one skill value. So it's not that much better at getting the clues, but if you succeed by two, you gain two resources instead of one, and that is that doesn't seem like much, but it is actually a really, really big deal. It doubles the economy you can get out of this, turning it from three resources net at most to nine resources net at most. This is a big deal and really reinforces to me what the Thieves Kit is doing in the context of the Rogue card pool. It is not the card that gives you the massive skill value boost because that's what lockpicks do. This is a card that gives you money and helps you a little bit with getting clues. And let's talk about that for a brief moment because Lockpicks has been a staple of the Rogue faction for the last several years. When you're talking clues in Rogue, you're almost always talking Lockpicks. You would often also be talking about Lola Santiago and maybe some Pilfer strategies, but Lockpicks really was the start of an engine and kind of what we all defaulted to when we are thinking about clues in Rogue. And I think that with this expansion, that might be getting shaken up a bit. Now, I'm not saying that Thieves Kit is going to be replacing a lockpicks in a lot of situations. In fact, I don't think it will replace it in a lot of decks that were very happy to play lockpicks. But it offers more options, especially for investigators that weren't very happy with lockpicks before. The thing is that lockpicks is very strong. It gives you a single massive investigate every turn. Only gives you one clue because it exhausts. So you're really having to get the most out of that one investigate but a lot of rogues would play it with cards like Lucky Cigarette Case, which would draw you a card if you succeeded by two or more, or Quick Thinking, which gives you additional action if you succeed by two or more, and have the lockpicks as this kind of core element of an engine. And I think that there will be rogues that will continue to do this, because this is just a solid strategy, right? It's time proven, it works, it's not the fastest strategy, but it gets the job done, and it is very reliable. By comparison, Thieves Kit is a little bit more bursty, I think. It doesn't exhaust, which lets you investigate with it multiple times a turn. And if you have things that give you additional actions, cards like Haste, for example, that becomes so much more, so much better and lets you really get a lot of clues in a short amount of time, assuming you can get your skill high enough, right? Where Lockpicks kind of deals with the skill value problem of things, but now you only get one clue per turn. Thieves Kit potentially gives you a lot of clues per turn, but you're having to figure out if you can manage your skill value properly. One other trick that I'm really excited to try with the Thieves Kit is the sleight of hand it, especially if you have some additional actions, right? Imagine being at a four clue location and two player, you just have a two per investigator location. You sleight of hand in the Thieves Kit, you investigate four times, you might even get as many as eight resources from doing that. Minus the one from sleight of hand, of course, but that is a lot of money. And then at the end of the turn, your Thieves Kit goes back into your hand and you can play it again and get even more money and even more clues. I think... It is fantastic that both of these cards can coexist, and I don't think either one of them is really drowning out the other. And that's not even mentioning Diamond Testimony, which we have also seen. And so I really feel that with these new cards, there's really just a broadening of what Rogue is capable of when it comes to clue getting. It is no longer the default that you will be using lockpicks, but that doesn't mean that lockpicks isn't good anymore. It just means that investigators that maybe didn't like lockpicks as much, or maybe just want to try something else, have options now. Moving on to Quick Getaway, this is a 2 cost 0 XP event uh, with 2 agility icons and it reads fast, play when, you, and when an enemy attacks you, evade, attempt to evade the attacking enemy, if you succeed, cancel the enemy's attack. Now note that's not instead of evading it, that's in addition to evading it. So you get one evade that both hopefully evades the enemy 
and works as a dodge. Can work similar to Narrow Escape, but the card that I think it got compared to the most was actually Swift Reflexes. So Swift Reflexes is a card that lets you take an additional action during any investigator's turn, which is also a two cost zero XP rogue event. Now the thing is, Swift Reflexes doesn't really get played all that much, and so having what is essentially a more narrow Swift Reflexes isn't a card I think a lot of people were excited about. But fortunately, there's a couple of things that Quick Getaway can do that Swift Reflexes can't. So let's talk about those. First, we can deal with Hunter enemies more efficiently. One of the problems is with Swift Reflexes is that you have to be at the location with the enemy in order to evade it. But if you've got a Hunter enemy at a connecting location, you can wait for them to hunt towards you in enemy phase, and then when they attack you, you can evade them. Now, granted, they'll most likely ready again in upkeep phase, but if you have cards like pickpocketing or other ways of benefiting off of evasion, this is not actually that bad of a strategy. Plus, anything's nice of not getting hit in the face by enemies, right? On top of that, if you're having to deal with massive enemies, this card actually gets a lot better. One of the things is that it can attack in the enemy phase, and then if you're the first person to get hit, you play Quick Getaway, you evade the Royal Emissary, or sorry, you evade the en massive enemy, the Royal Emissary in this case, and now your teammate also doesn't get hit because the enemy is now exhausted. We're not 100% sure that that's how massive enemies are supposed to work, because the ruling doesn't actually completely, totally, clearly state, but it's almost certainly that once a massive enemy has been exhausted, it will stay exhausted and so we can protect our teammates using this. Now all that to say, that's not really selling me on this card either, but fortunately there's one word on that card that I haven't mentioned yet, and that's the trait, trick. This is a trick card, and because of that there are two other cards in the game that really care about tricks that make me think that this card will be perfectly fine and will get played, and those are Chuck Fergus and Rita Young. Now, I actually also forgot to put Crafty on here. Crafty also cares about Trick, but I think it's the, the point will come across. So the thing here is that Chuck Fergus, when you use Quick Getaway right with him, you can reduce the cost of this card to zero, which is fantastic, and you get plus two skill value during the evasion. Obviously, you have to be playing Chuck, but if you have Chuck in your deck or are planning to include him, then you would much rather have Quick Getaway over something else that does a similar role because of the ability for this to be discounted by Chuck's ability. And then finally, Rita can take trick cards and she just can't take any of the other cards and she can take this. And Rita has a reaction ability that benefits off evading enemies, especially when it comes to that hunter enemy evasion. This certainly becomes way more interesting for her especially in solo, where an enemy could move towards her, attack her, she evades it, dodges the attack, and then gets a free move away with her reaction. I actually like this card for Rita. I think if you're playing a crafty Rita build, you put this in. I think it seems good. So those are the two rogue cards I already talked about. Next up, we have the Hallowed Chalice from Los Archivos the Arkham. This is a three cost, zero XP mystic asset, willpower icon, with the item and charm traits. Uh, takes up a hand slot and has an action ability to choose an investigator at your location and either choose one, exhaust Hello Chalice and place one Doom on it to heal two damage or two horror from that investigator, or heal one damage or one horror from that investigator. If you heal the last damage or horror from that investigator, remove one Doom from Hello Chalice. So we've seen this kind of templating before on the Dowsing Rod and the Ceremonial Sickle, and they seem to be kind of a charm cycle in this expansion. And I think initial review of this was quite skeptical and, and quite negative, but I actually think this is a perfectly reasonable card to include. There's not a lot of level zero uh, healing in general that's good. I'll confess that this isn't the best either, but it's better than a lot of the options we have available. And the fact that it doesn't use any kind of charges and can heal both damage and horror actually puts this like above most other healing options for me. Like it's better than I think it seems. Now, obviously, when I'm talking about this card, I'm immediately thinking about Amina, which can play this card for zero, and that's a big deal. This card costing three is a lot. If you're paying full price for this thing, you are obviously hurting a bit. The fact that it can take care of its own doom is very nice, but also I just kind of like how this, I think, is going to play, where you're waiting until somebody has taken three damage and horror, or horror, sorry, and then you exhaust it, put a doom on it to heal two of it, and then use another action to get the last one off and get the doom off. And that obviously is very action expensive, right? It, it takes a lot of time to use this card, 
But there are a bunch of investigators in this game that can turn that kind of effect into a lot of tempo, right? Agnes, whenever she takes horror, she can deal damage to enemies. Mark, whenever he takes damage, he can draw cards. So there are ways of turning horror, damage, that sort of stuff into tempo. And then you can use something like the Hello Chalice to heal people back up. And if you're Carolyn, you even get resources while you're doing that. I do think that this is not, you know, this is not going to be any kind of game breaking card. But as far as level zero healing go, you could do worse than this. Trust me, it's actually not that bad. It's not great. It's never going to be great because if it was great, it would probably be broken. Healing can be very strong. And so having a card that's a little slow, a little clunky, but has infinite uses, I think that I think this card is fine. I think you're going to want to use this. You know, in your like, if you're especially if you're playing campaign for the first time, you don't know what you're up against. Sometimes you just auto fill rotting remains, and you just need to get rid of three horror. This card will do that. Okay, don't sleep on this card. Like just put just put one copy of it in your deck, right? All right, moving on. We have our next investigator for this cycle. We have Daryl Simmons. He was previewed by Miskatonic University Radio. He is the photographer. He's the survivor. He has two willpower, five intellect, two combat. Three agility. He has the reporter trait. You begin the game with Daryl's codec in play. Free trigger during a skill test at your location. Spend one evidence from an asset you control. Reduce the difficulty of this test by two. Limit once per test. Elder sign effect plus one. Place one evidence on an asset you control. Six health, eight sanity. And flavor text the truth is darker than any of us know. It's card number 15. So he starts the game with Daryl's Kodak in play. We should probably talk about that right away. Daryl's Kodak is a two cost asset, but keep in mind, he starts the game with it. So you don't actually have to pay for that unless it gets discarded somehow. Uh, it has the intellect, agility, and wild icons. It is an item and tool traded. It doesn't take up any slots, important. And it reads Daryl Simmons deck only. Reaction, after an enemy or treachery enters play, exhaust the camera. Place one resource from the token pool on that enemy or treachery as evidence. Free, uh, reaction, after you discover any number of clues, move that many evidence on enemies or treacheries at that location or not at any location to Daryl's codec. So the way that this works is whenever you draw an enemy or a treachery that stays in play, you put a resource on that card. And then whenever you get clues at that location, you can take that evidence onto the camera. If those cards are not at any location because they're just kind of in the in the void or next to the agenda deck, then you can put the you can get the clues anywhere and you can get the evidence. This is just an evidence gathering card, but it's actually kind of interesting how it influences playstyle. We'll get back to that in a moment. Let's talk about his deck building first. Deck size of 30, survivor cards 0 to 5, seeker cards 0 to 2, neutral cards 0 to 5. Daryl is the second to last core set style deck building. The only one we're missing is Seeker 0 to 5, Rogue 0 to 2. And this immediately makes him one of the strongest investigators in the entire game, or at the very least, probably the strongest investigator in this box. The flexibility, versatility, and just raw power in that deck building is incredible. And I think Daryl is going to be a powerhouse. Uh, I haven't really worked out any like interesting Daryl deck builds. I've talked about a couple of the more core cards and I'll talk about a couple more before we end the video. But as it comes, I think he's just kind of generically very strong and I'm having my di uh, difficulty wrapping my head around what a good Daryl deck looks like. So I'll definitely be doing a deep dive video of him later, at least I'm hoping to, if I can puzzle out kind of things to talk about. Because with Kamani, after I played them a couple of times, I've definitely found myself wanting to talk about certain aspects of their playstyle, and hopefully with Daryl, I can do the same. I've only gotten a chance to like play a couple of rounds with him just between other activities. So far, he seems interesting. We'll have to see if I can build him in more powerful, tricky ways. As for the rest of his deck building requirements, obviously he needs to take Daryl's Kodak, and he also has a weakness, Ruined Film, and then one random basic weakness. Ruined Film is a treachery weakness, blunder with a revelation effect, remove four evidence from cards you control. For each evidence you cannot remove in this way, take one horror. Note, you don't get the choice. If you have evidence, the evidence has to go. If you, do, uh, if you don't, then you start taking horror. This could potentially deal four horror to you turn one, so be careful with that. But you also have eight sanity and you have survivor access, you'll probably be fine. 
I think more likely than not, this is just gonna wipe out a bunch of your evidence. So what do you do with your evidence? Well, the ability on them is actually really powerful. So difficulty reduction obviously is quite strong. You know, most of you will probably have played with flashlights before, and if you can get a difficulty zero test, you automatically succeed unless you draw an auto fail. But having the ability to difficulty reduce any test is actually more powerful even than that, because cards like Grasping Hands, which deal damage to you equal to the amount you fail by, you can reduce the difficulty and you cannot fail by more than the difficulty. So if you draw Grasping Hands, you can spend one evidence from Daryl to make it deal no more than one damage. That's fantastic. That is so much pr uh, protection. And it's not even just skill tests he's performing. He can even do it on his teammate's skill tests. This ability is very strong. I think evidence is going to be a pricey economy. Uh, economy. You really want to get lots of that. There's not a lot of cards that Daryl can take that give him additional evidence. Uh, Hawkeye Folding Camera from The Circle Undone is one of them. Every time you discover the last clue from a location, you can put an evidence on it, but only once per game at each location. Still, this is probably a pretty useful evidence pool or, or evidence generator, as is the empirical hypothesis that was previewed recently. This customizable card lets you get evidence if you fail by or succeed by at a certain amount and you can then spend that evidence to draw cards. Well, with Daryl, you could also use it to reduce the difficulty of a test. So far, the only evidence cards that, that we've seen are in Seeker or one in Rogue because the Deming Testimony is actually uses evidence. And there's like the five XP Guardian Seeker assets. Uh, Michael Lee from Edge of the Earth is also using evidence, but he can't take that and he can't take Deming Testimony either. So. I'm wondering if we'll see an evidence card out of Survivor, because so far it looks like most of the evidence for him is coming out of Seeker. So what do you do with Daryl? Well, I mean, it wouldn't be a Veronica video if I didn't talk about scavenging. So yeah, obviously he has five intellect. He has lots of tools to give him more intellect and you just play scavenging, right? You can easily succeed by two on an investigate, getting back item cards. And we've seen from Edge of the Earth, we have a lot of scavenging support. So. I think that if you are just starting out um, and you're pretty new to the game, you have maybe Edge of the Earth and this is your second expansion, play Daryl with Scavenging. I think he'll be very good. The other thing that I'm interested in trying in him is using cards that let you investigate other locations or investigate remotely. So one of the things that I noted in my like four rounds of playing Daryl is that I often needed to be somewhere else to get the clues because monsters were spawning here and there and treacheries were getting attached to other locations. And then I had to go over there and discover the clues at those locations because the way that the codec work, you have to be at that location and then start investigating there. And the tricky part there is also that if you do that, you of course have to avoid attacks of opportunity from enemies. And Daryl's stat line is not very good at dealing with enemies. I think this is actually what makes him a survivor. He's very good at finding all these weird, creepy things, but he's not actually very good at dealing with what he finds. And so he actually ends up uh, stuck over his head and that's what makes him a survivor. Like he's in over his head and he's like very, yeah, he's in danger. He's gonna need other investigators to bail him out or he's gonna have to use cards like the pocket telescope to help investigate from a distance and thereby negate the drawback of having to run in with the enemies to get the evidence. I think Daryl's an interesting investigator, but I'm having difficulty kind of wrapping around where I want to go with him. But that being said, the survivor card pool is very deep. Seeker 0 to 2 is very deep, so I'm sure there will be some cool things that we can do with him. And of course, we haven't seen a lot of the cards from Scarlet Keys yet, so there's possible that there's entirely new playstyles in there as well. Now, one card that we've seen that was previewed that might help Daryl deal with those treacheries and enemies a bit better is actually Grizzled. This was previewed by the Mythos Busters. And it's a customizable skill card in Survivor. Grizzled has a single wild icon, is innate and developed, and customizable. When you purchase Grizzled, choose to record two traits on its upgrade sheet. So you have to name two traits. If this is a skill test on or against an encounter card, including fighting, evading, or parlaying, Grizzled gains two wild icons for each chosen trait that encounter card possesses. So Okay, let's, let's put that into practical use. If you're beset by a ghoul minion and you've named monster and terror, you can commit Grizzled on an attack or evade against that ghoul minion and you get plus three. That's pretty good. 
if you have frozen, if you then draw frozen in fear, you could also use this for three wild icons on that frozen in fear test. I think Grizzled is a very flexible card. When I first saw it, I actually hadn't seen Daryl yet. And so I was like, why would survivors want this? Survivors are usually very good at dealing with enemies and treacheries, right? They, they run away. They're not that scared. But as it turns out, Daryl has pretty poor defensive stats. So this is pretty great for him. And of course, because it's a customizable card, we get some upgrades. The first two upgrades are specialist for one box. And then for two box, you can choose another trait. Now, in order to like figure out what exactly you want here, I actually have to give a big shout out to Reddit user u slash soul turtle, who made a big old analysis of all the campaigns and just kind of picking out which traits look the best to them. I'll put a link in the description to that Reddit thread. Go check it out. I'm just like posting the most obvious things here, but you probably want to be looking at your campaign, figuring out what is like the best for you and then just picking some good choices. One thing that I definitely want to mention is that elite is a trait, which is on almost every boss enemy in the game. So if you're dealing with a lot of bosses that you're having trouble with, go ahead and maybe spend that specialist XP to get elite on there as well, especially later on into campaign where there's more, more boss enemies and they're scarier. This will really help you out. So you maybe start out with some simpler traits and then you get elite on there as well. Next up, we have nemesis. Now, Nemesis is interesting. It's a three XP up upgrade. If the skill test on or against an enemy with a chosen trait, and that is successful, you may attach Grizzle to that enemy and reduce the difficulty of tests on or against the attacked enemy by one. So basically, if you can succeed on a test against that enemy with Grizzle committed, then every test against that enemy gets easier. I think this is an okay effect. I don't think this is fantastic. And 3XP is actually kind of pushing how much I'd be willing to pay for that. But on the other hand, it is kind of nice against boss enemies. So again, the elite trait coming back in. And it's also very nice if you, for example, have to evade an enemy and then fight it multiple times. Or maybe you're very good at fighting because you're someone like Yorick, but you actually want to run away. You can throw it into a big test that you know you're going to succeed and then have it stick around a bit for later while you try to evade or fight or whatever you're less good at. Though keep in mind, you do definitely want to kill the enemy because you want to get this back into your discard pile so you can reuse it. You don't want to have the enemy stuck with the grizzled all the time. Speaking of not wanting to have the grizzled stuck all the time, like next up is Mythos Hearted. If this skill test is on a treachery with a chosen trait and the test is successful, you may add both grizzled and that treachery to the victory display. Now, this is reminiscent of a card that's actually quite good. It's the Eye of Truth, which has four wild icons. If you succeed on a test against a treachery, you can attach that treachery to the victory display. And then for the rest of the game, whenever somebody else draws the uh, treachery that Eye of Truth is attached to, you get the four wild icons again. The problem is that Grizzle doesn't have that last bit of text. Basically, you don't get the extra skill icons whenever you draw another copy of the card that's in the victory display. So the only thing this 4 XP upgrade is doing is removing a card from the victor from the encounter deck that you already dealt with once. I don't like this. I try not to be too negative, but I really just am struggling to ever imagine a situation where I want this. Because even in situations where you're like four player and you have a small encounter deck where you really don't want to deal with certain treacheries lots of times, almost always the treacheries you least want to deal with are things like ancient evils or mysterious chanting, which do not have tests on them. So you can't even use that on those. And anything that you could test on, Grizzled is already giving you a big boost and you can get this back. So like, why? I don't really get this. If anybody is like sees a very powerful use case for this, I mean, it's probably possible with the amount of like cards that we have that can like negate enemies and put treacheries in the encounter deck. Maybe we can like completely nullify the encounter deck and have like zero cards in there, but that feels like a stretch and I don't really, I don't know. Let's go on to the final upgrade, which actually one I am really excited about. This 5 XP upgrade is always prepared. After you draw an encounter card with the chosen trait, return one copy of Grizzled from your discard pile to your hand, max once per round. Heck yeah, this is the survivor faction I know. This is the survivors I love. You can have two or three traits chosen on this for a little bit of XP. So like for three XP, you could have one specialist so it gives you three traits, and whenever you draw a card with one of those traits, you get to get a copy of this back, and it's three wild icons. Heck yeah, 
I feel like this is a fantastic solo card, fantastic solo edition, because whenever you have something that you have to deal with, you have the tools on hand to deal with this. And more importantly, if you use a card like Short Supply to start by discarding 10 cards from your deck, then you can even have this in your discard pile. And the first time one of these shows up, grab one to your hand and you're ready to go. I really like this. I think this is the one upgrade that like makes me like this card and otherwise I was kind of down on it. So I'm happy that it's there because this really feels like why I want to play Grizzled. Uh, keep in mind that because it is 5 XP, uh, that's gating it to investigators who can take Survivor 3 or higher because it makes it uh, a level 3 card if you've bought this. Because again, customizable level is half of the amount of boxes you've checked rounded down. Uh, rounded up, sorry. And yeah, that's the four cards and the very quick glimpse at Daryl Simmons. I'm hoping to do more on Daryl later, but I really am having difficulty figuring out how to play him without actually having played him. So I'm going to be testing him a bit and then I'll be getting back to you. There's more preview cards still coming, so please uh, stay, stay around. Subscribe if you haven't. There's more videos coming. Thank you for watching and I'll be seeing you until the end of time.